we acknowledge that we gather for our worship on the traditional territories of the neutral tribes, Erie, Huron, and the other native peoples who followed them as the original nations of this land. And we acknowledge with respect their history, their spirituality, and their culture. Hello, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you for joining us at Grace United Church in Burlington. May you be uplifted and comforted by the Word of God as we worship together. Welcome to this Worldwide Communion Sunday. Please have some elements ready so you can join in with us for communion later on in the service. Thank you to those who have completed their Future Value Survey. For those who haven't, please get them in today. And also I'd like to remind you that you can catch up with events that are happening at Grace with the News You Can Use videos also on the YouTube channel. As we center ourselves for worship, we light our candles today remembering we're not alone. We live in God's world. God is with us bringing light and love to all our living. Today around the world, people gather to break bread and pour wine. We gather with them in heart and mind. We who share in God's banquet come eagerly to be fed. Let us worship, celebrating God's bounty. God of mercy and of grace, you alone are God. This day, the followers of Jesus gather around a table which stretches 25,000 miles around the whole of the earth. As bread that was scattered on the hillside long ago was gathered together and made one, so too we, your people, scattered throughout the world, are gathered together around your table and become one. As grapes grown in the field, are gathered together and pressed into wine, so too are we drawn together, impressed by our times to share our common life. Open our eyes, our minds, and our lives that we might welcome one another, even as you continue to welcome us. Hoping to be transformed anew into the body of Christ, we pray Jesus' prayer together, singing Our Father.
time today, I thought we'd reflect on rules. And I thought back to when I was a little person, and usually the person who gave the rules was mom. And it was often easy to think, oh, she's just being mean. She doesn't want me to have any fun. But every time I really broke the rules, I ended up getting hurt. It started off when I was a toddler. My mom told me, don't climb the stairs on your own. Well, sure enough, at two years of age, I climbed the stairs and I took a tumble and I broke my arm. Well, fast forward three more years and there was a building project happening down the street from our home. And my mom had seen some kids climbing on the foundations. And so sure enough, came to me and said, Helen, don't climb on the foundations. Well, sure enough, my friends and I decided to go climb on the foundations and guess who fell? And guess who broke her arm again? Well, the moral to the story is my mom knew what she was talking about. I hate to admit that, but she did. All of a sudden I had to realize, you know, she wasn't giving me these rules because she was mean and nasty and wanted me to have a miserable life. She was giving me these rules because she was trying to keep me safe. And the same is true with God. What God did when God gave people of Israel the Ten Commandments, what God was really doing was of providing them with a way to life. So let us continue to worship as we reflect on rules and the commandments. Reading selected verses from Exodus 20, telling the story of the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Today's gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46, the parable of the landowner and the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, 
Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Has come before God with prayer. Gracious God, grant us understanding so that we might know you, curiosity that we might seek you, and faithfulness that we might embrace you as those seeking life, light, and love, we pray. Amen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating. These are the opening words to the United Church Creed. It all starts with a relationship, one that understands that this world is not ours, but shared with us by the one who created it and continues that labor. Yes, there are statements that follow about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Church, our call, but our creed clarifies that everything we do, who we are, everything we believe, is anchored in our relationship with God. The same is true of the people of Israel. Today in our Old Testament reading, we heard about the Ten Commandments. Some consider Moses' defining moment, his encounter with the burning bush. For others, it was the introduction of the Passover, but not even the wandering in the wilderness, nor the parting of the Red Sea compare or measure up to the receiving of the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. We now live in a fun age when many refer to the commandments without actually knowing many of them. In 2007, there was a survey that reported that most modern-day North Americans could rattle off the ingredients of a Big Mac 
more readily than the Ten Commandments. These commandments first come across as a set of rules, a binding list of do's and don'ts. The Jewish people call the commandments law or Torah, and Torah literally means guidance or help. That's what God intended the law to be, a guide and a help. These laws were not initially intended to be for all people at all times and in all places. Initially, they were integral to the identity of a particular people at a particular place in a certain time in history. And they were given to the people of Israel as a gift and a blessing. And just like our creed, it all started in a relationship. Before one word of rule is uttered by God, God reminds the people of who God is and the foundations of the relationship. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So God starts with a resume, a statement of how God has been revealed in a very specific time, in a recent act of liberation. And only then does God start into the expectations of how the people should relate to God and each other. Looking for wisdom about rules, I found that our common modern understanding seems to be that following the rules limits life, limits creativity, limits fun, limits progress, limits growth. Even the Dalai Lama is quoted as saying, know the rules well so you can break them effectively. At the same time, over the last 3,400 years, the Ten Commandments have not changed. Civilizations have changed, knowledge has changed, medicine has changed, science and technology, nations, governments, they've all changed. But the Ten Commandments still work because humans haven't changed. Once upon a time, there were two men in a truck. Neither one was very bright and they were passing through a small town. They came to an overpass with a sign that read clearance 11 foot 3. They got out and they measured their rig. It was 12 foot 4. As they climbed back into the cab, one of them asked, what do you think we should do? The driver looked around, then shifted into gear, saying, there isn't a cop in sight, let's take a chance. Know how that's going to go. The commandments were not about creating a system of law and punishment. They were a window into the stories and the lifestyle of the culture of God. They're not ten burdens to labor under, but ten invitations into freedom, into gracious culture of God, and ten vital signs of life in all its fullness. They were all about pointing a new way of wholeness and harmony in our relationships. The first four focus on our relationship with God, and the last six focus on relationships between people. Jesus, in his living and teaching, did not nullify the Ten Commandments. Instead, he shone a light at the core of their intent. Between the time of Moses and the time of Jesus, devout religious types had expanded the Ten to 600 laws. So when Jesus focused in on two laws, Love God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He was drawing his followers back into the initial framework of the Ten Guideposts. But for Jesus, it was ultimately not about the law, but the lawgiver. It's not about the rules again, it's about the relationship. Jesus taught his followers that the commandments are made for the people and not the people for the commandments. Jesus hoped we would go beyond the law, using love as our litmus test. Because love leaves no loopholes. And like my truck driving buddies from earlier, we humans love to look for the loopholes. But Jesus knew that love changes people. It changes our motivation. It reshapes the way we think. It changes the things we want. And it alters how we see one another and transforms how we treat each other. When Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he was again acknowledging that the relationship comes first. 
A relationship of love precedes a life of obedience. Now, 2020 has been quite the year, hasn't it? Well, now as the leaves are starting to change color and breezes chill and days shorten, we know winter's coming. Many are dreading winter and what's ahead. Being in physical isolation was really tough in the spring, but the thought of starting winter with a second wave of the pandemic looming can bring anybody down. As we face all this, it's vital that we refocus on the relationships that we have and live into those words of promise from our creed, we are not alone. We have a relationship with God who doesn't leave us alone, who created and is still creating. Today, we celebrate Worldwide Communion Sunday, and so we're being reminded that while different this year, we still gather with sisters and brothers around the world, recognizing our relationships with and connection to each other. Together, we acknowledge the one who came in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, to celebrate that we are part of a community that spans the globe as well as time. But it's hard. It's hard when the rules say we need to cover our faces and remain physically distant. Like our truck driving friends, there's a temptation to defy the rules. Like them, we know that measuring the distance has consequences. But maybe it would help to recognize these rules are not intended to be limitations, but if we reframe them, they're guideposts gifted to us by a living God, calling us to life. Following the rules is yet again an act of love. It's a way that we can show our love of God, our neighbors, and ourselves. But even with love, we still have one mountain to tackle. With physical isolation compounded by weather forcing us indoors, many are anticipating and dreading being alone. But here we're faced with a choice in how we look at being alone. Theologian Paul Tillich says our language has wisely sensed the two sides of being alone. It's created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone. And it's created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. Robert Fulgham reminds us that solitude is not the same as loneliness. Solitude is a solitary boat floating in a sea of possible companions. So when alone, if loneliness creeps into our being, I offer you the following mantra. Repeat after me. We are not alone. I am not alone. If we repeat that to ourselves, we are not alone, I am not alone, maybe it could make a difference. Franklin Roosevelt once said, if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples, all of all kinds, to live together in the same world at peace. Again, it comes back to relationship. We are not alone because the God who promises never to leave us alone continues to work in us and others by the Spirit. God has gifted us with a loving community, which means we need to say this mantra to ourselves, but also to affirm it for each other. We need to connect with each other regularly to remind each other, you are not alone. I am not alone. We are not alone. In The Brave Art of Motherhood, Rachel Marie Martin writes, Don't give up on this year. Keep fighting for good. Keep showing up. Keep loving. Keep giving back. Keep being kind. Keep being brave. Keep caring. Keep trying new things. Keep showing grace. Keep on. The world needs you to believe in the good. And I would add, the world needs you to believe in the healing power of God's love. So continue to hang on and hang in. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.
We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil. To proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us come before God with a prayer dedicating our gifts. Gracious God, we bring our gifts and our commitment to be shared with our community and beyond, with those who hunger and thirst. Receive and bless our offerings, we pray. Amen. Christ invites us all to this worldwide banquet, and so we gather at tables in many places around the world. We are sisters and brothers from above and below the equator, from the north and from down under, from every time zone around the globe. As today's sunlight inches across the land and sea, Christians gather to celebrate their place in God's family. We differ in age, in race, in gender, in orientation, politics, and denominations, but we are one in Christ. Let us come as children of God, just as we are. Wherever we are on this journey of life, we are welcome. Christ's table will be wide. Christ's welcome will be wide. Christ's arms will be open wide to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive, and we will become bread for a hungering world and we will become drink for those who thirst, and the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free, the life of Jesus to recall, in love laid down for me, in love laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near. Each proud division 
Let us come before God with thanksgiving. Loving and gracious God, who summons galaxies into being, we give thanks and blessings to you. We bless you for our world. The diversity of our planet amazes us from the prairies and the pampas of the Americas to the dusty deserts of Africa and Asia. From the majestic mountains of Europe to the vast outback of Australia, we give you thanks for the multiplicity of humanity, with our complexity of color and culture, yet called into oneness of being through Christ. With many tongues, yet one voice, we honor you singing. Loving and gracious God, who surrounds creation with abundant love, we give thanks and blessings to you. We bless you for your love made known to us through Jesus, which reassures and reconciles us to you, to ourselves and to one another. As Christ is our light from you, may we be lights to others, illuminating the path towards communion with you and the Holy Spirit and Jesus our friend and brother. We remember the stories that Jesus' friends told, stories of bread broken and shared, feeding a multitude, stories of being gathered together, enemy and friend around tables, stories of unlikely guests revealing the face of the sacred. They say that it was on a night of both celebration and betrayal that he took the bread left over on the table and he blessed it and broke it, reminding them that it's in the breaking that we become whole, in the losing our lives that we find them, in serving that we are served. As the grain scattered becomes one in the loaf, when we eat this bread, we become one with one another. They say that he took the cup also left over on the table, poured out and sharing, remembering with them the life-giving breath, even now pounding a rhythm through our veins the breath of life from whence we come, the breath that proceeds and follows all that we can see. As the grapes find life in the vine, when we drink this cup, we become at one with the source of life itself. Let us recall the mysteries of our faith as we sing. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes might be open, that we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst, indeed in one another. Come Holy Spirit, come. God, may this bread connect us more closely with you and with our neighbors near and far. Bless this bread, we pray. May this fruit of the vine remind us of the interconnectedness of people around the world. Bless this cup, we pray. May this simple meal bring us into union with you your people and your world, united in one body of Christ. The bread of life shared for you. The cup of the new covenant shared with you.
Let us come before God with thanksgiving and the prayers of the people. O oh God, we have taken into our hands the signs and symbols of our faith. We have eaten the bread and drunk from the cup with our brothers and sisters around the world today. In doing so, help us remember that the Ten Commandments and the life and teachings of Jesus are only some of the pathways that you've gifted to the world, helping lead us to you. Help us now to live by the law of the spirit of life, a law which written upon our hearts of faith and not only on tablets of stone, makes all of human life a joy and a blessing. O oh God, continue to direct us with your gentle touch, your still small voice, which speaks to our hearts and minds, urging us back to that which is sensible and spiritual, that sure road that leads to abundant life. Become our door to life, to the blazing light that stirs our spirits and gives us hope. In our walled rooms of cynicism, where we hang pictures of life, open a window to the wonder of real life that you set before us, a life of infinite possibilities, a life of eternal purpose. Gracious God, we thank you for drawing us together as one family, a family that reaches around the world. We thank you, God, for your gracious love, for your wonderful mercy. Help us this day, O oh God, to live by faith and to love one another in the way that you love us. Help us keep jealousy and envy out of our hearts. Help us keep pride and selfishness out of our conversations and desire and greed out of our relationships. Protect us, O God, from all our fears and make it our ambition to always do your will. Watch this day over our church community and our church around the world, as well as our brothers and sisters of differing faiths. Help us witness to your love and your grace, to share with those who are less fortunate than we are, to support those who work for justice and equity, to assist those who bring hope and health and healing to those in despair. We hold before you too, O oh God, all our burdens, and we bring before you the burdens that others bear. Breathe your spirit into us once more, O oh God, that we may sense the inspiration of your love and have confidence and trust in your guidance. Bless us on our journey this day. Amen.
led by God's word and God's banquet, God's presence reaffirmed, let us now take the light of Christ out into the world. Having been fed by God, may we go forth to share the bread of life. By God's grace, there is more than enough for all. So may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God's countenance be lifted up upon us and God give us peace. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.